Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, and good afternoon. It is a truly great pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to this afternoon's session of this landmark event. This summit, as you know, celebrates the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. I'm so gratified that we are holding it here at the University of Texas and in the LBJ Library. As most of you know, the University of Texas has been an actor in the civil rights struggle and not always on the right side. In 1950, we were the defendant in the Supreme Court case of Sweat v. Painter. Happily, we lost that case. <laughs> the decision spelled the death of separate but equal, at least as a legal matter and therefore paved the way to Brown versus the Board of Education. Only two days after that historic decision, we integrated our graduate school, and we became one of the first flagship universities in the South to enroll African-American students. In the years that followed, progress was slow, and at times, halting. We still have challenges to overcome, yet here we are, just more than a half century later, and we're in a very different world. And that's due to the legacy of the Civil Rights Movement and to the legacy of the Civil Rights Act and to the legacy of President Johnson. <laughs> and we're not through, of course. The progress must continue. In 2012, UT Austin returned to the Supreme Court to defend our admissions policy that includes race as one of many factors and to argue for the critical educational importance and educational value of a diverse student body. The Supreme Court remanded Fisher to the Fifth Circuit, and that decision may come down at any time. We stand ready to defend diversity. The The University of Texas takes great pride in hosting this national conversation on civil rights, and we take great pride in the son of Texas, President Johnson, with the help, who, with the help and sacrifice of many thousands of others, finally enshrined civil rights into our laws. This campus has been tied to the Johnson family and the Johnson administration for a long time and at a very deep level. The strongest tie, of course, was also its earliest, when Mrs. Johnson earned not one but two degrees here in the 1930s. Her involvement with her, with her alma mater never waned and still lives on through her daughters, Linda and Lucy, and their families, and of course, through the LBJ Foundation, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, the LBJ Library, and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildlife Center. And as LBJ began to draw talent from Texas, other UT alumni reported to the White House, like Larry Temple and George Christian and Bill Moyers. And in later years, veterans of the Johnson administration often found their home on our campus. And in 1971, UT became the first university in America to be the home of a presidential library. I dare say that experiment has been successful. <laughs> and that success has never been more evident than on this day, when the president's legacy and a university's mission have come together to, celebra to celebrate a high achievement of our civilization and to help ensure its future. So to Mark Up Grove and everyone at the LBJ Library, to the Johnson family, I say congratulations. And to all of you, I say welcome. <laughs>
and thank you for helping us with this important and historic event. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the following is a phone conversation between President Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King Jr. that took place on November 25th, 1963, three days after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. I haven't seen him, but I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that, and I knew that you had just that great spirit, and you know you have our support and backing. Well, because we know what a difficult period this is. It's, a, it's a just an impossible period. It's so imperative. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. I well, never needed more than I do now. Well, you know you have it, and just feel free to call on us for anything. Please welcome Mr. Tom Johnson. Good afternoon. I had the great honor of chairing the Lyndon B. Johnson Foundation for 30 years. Among the finest achievements that current chairman Larry Temple and I claim is that we recruited Mark up to Grove as the director of this LBJ library. And this three-day program is a terrific tribute to Mark and his wonderful staff. Mark, stand, please. From 1965 until the end of his term, I served as an aide to President Johnson. On April 4, 1968, I had the sad duty of taking a flash Associated Press message into the Oval Office and handed it to President Johnson that read, Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot in Memphis. Our world changed that tragic day. President Johnson had enormous respect for Dr. King. They worked closely together to pass the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, what we are celebrating this week, 50 years later. Our panelists to discuss the relationship between these two men is about as good as it gets. First, Doris Kearns Goodwin, a Pulitzer Prize winning author a former member of the LBJ White House staff and one of the first members of the White House Fellows Program that was created by President Johnson and by John Gardner. Joe Califano, who served as domestic affairs advisor, better put domestic affairs czar for President Johnson from 1965 to 1969. Ambassador Andrew Young, one of Dr. King's very closest age, aides, the first African-American United States Congressman elected from the Deep South since Reconstruction, appointed by President Carter as United States Ambassador to the United Nations, and mayor of my city of Atlanta from 1982 until 1990. Taylor Branch, Pulitzer Prize winning author, best known for his writings on civil rights, his book, Parting the Waters, America in the King Years, won the Pulitzer in 1989. Our moderator today is Todd Purdom, a contributing editor at Vanity Fair, a senior editor at Politico. He recently published a book, An Idea Whose Time Has Come, Two Presidents, Two Parties, and the Battle for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Todd Purdom, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Andrew Young, Joe Califano, and Taylor Branch. Thanks. 
thank you very much, Tom and Mark and the entire staff of the Johnson Library and the Johnson Foundation. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I want this to be a conversation, and today of all days, I have only one exhortation for my fellow discussants, no filibusters. <laughs> so with that being said, I think it's fair to say that Lyndon Baines Johnson and Martin Luther King were two of the most colossal, consequential figures of the 20th century. Bill Moyers, Johnson's longtime aide, said that the president was 13 of the most complex and interesting and difficult men he'd ever met. <laughs> uh, Stan Levison, Dr. King's close aide, said that he was anything but the plaster saint that white America so desperately wanted him to be. So I thought that we might begin our discussion today, not at the beginning of the Civil Rights Bill, but at the end, on July 4th, 1964, because I think this exchange offers a little bit of a window into the complexity of their personalities and their relationship. It was the 4th of July. President Johnson had come home to Texas after signing the bill two days before. And he seized on a quote from his press secretary, George Reedy, that he'd been in continual touch with Dr. King. Why do you say that, Johnson said. That's the last thing the president has been in continual touch with Dr. King, Reedy said. I've said from time to time he's seen Martin Luther King, is what I said. Well, why do you say that, Johnson demanded. <laughs> well, Reedy said, you saw him at the ceremony. Well, I say, why do you say it? Because I was asked, because they'd seen you there. <laughs> I'm sorry he was there, Johnson said. It was very unfortunate he was there, and don't you get hung in on it. So I was struck by listening to that tape and reading those words that on the moment of the president's greatest triumph, he would have such complex feelings about Dr. King. All of you, to one degree or another, have explored this question. Could I start with you, Ambassador Young? What was the nature of President Johnson's intense and, let's say, you know, brief partnership with Dr. King? Well, it, I don't think it was that brief, but it was very intense. And I think it was very warm and personal. Whenever I went with them, there was never an argument or no tension. There was gentlemen's disagreement. Dr. King saw himself as having to keep the pressure on. And let, let me just end with the, the story that when we left before the Voting Rights Act, uh, right after the, the Nobel Prize, President Johnson talked for an hour about why he didn't have the power to introduce voting rights legislation in 1965 and gave very good reasons. But he kept saying, I just don't have the power. I wish I did. When we left, I asked Dr. King, well, what did you think? He said, I think we got to figure out a way to get this president some power. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought at the time that, that it was awful arrogant of him to say that, except that we had not been back in Atlanta for three days before Amelia Boynton came over from Selma with a report on the voting atrocities in Selma and pleading with Dr. King, you got to come help us in Selma. And this was not anything we were aware of, a plan. It, it was thrust upon us. And we went to Selma on the 2nd of January. And by the end of March, the president had all the power he needed to get that Voting Rights Act introduced. I want to get to Selma in a minute. I know Joe has some, uh, something to say about that. But if I, could, if I could just start by asking you, Taylor, Lyndon Johnson's views on race evolved over time. And I think when he became president in the wake of the tragedy of the assassination, a lot of civil rights groups were not so sure of his record. After all, he was most known to many people at that point for having watered down the 57 and 60 bills to get them passed, the first law since Reconstruction. But what was the arc of his consciousness on the question of race and the necessity of, uh, of comprehensive civil rights law? I don't think I know him well enough to say that, and I certainly wouldn't pre presume that the arc is measured by his voting record. His voting record is a practical thing. I think you might even be able to argue that his views on race were fixed uh, when he was teaching in Catullo, or, or even before that, when, when, when he taught drama in the 1920s by teaching people, first of all, to make animal noises and be comfortable exposing themselves in front of other people and getting out of their self-consciousness about being around other people and getting a, a sense of, uh, of exposing yourself to, to different kinds of people. I think Johnson had an enormous empathy his whole lifetime. In practical politics, 
made it impossible for that to express itself until he, until he got close to the White House, well, certainly in the 57 bill. So, uh, you know, I think that's a mystery with a man in public life as long as, as he was. Um, it presents a mystery looking back on it. Did he suddenly have a conversion, which I think is the common uh, view of it, to, to take his earlier votes as reflecting his inner feelings? Uh, and that's really hard to, to reconcile with the sustained sub, nominating Thurgood Marshall in the middle of the, of, of, yeah. of the Vietnam War. Uh, I think that that, that that tends to show the le- longevity of that record through the upheavals and the backlash against civil rights uh, shows that those were probably his sincere views. And my, my guess is that they were formed long before it is popularly uh, it's popular to believe they were there. Doris, one of the revelations to me in doing this book, and you know both families, both men, is that John Kennedy's acquaintance with black people was basically limited to his two valets and to the leaders of the movement itself. Lyndon Johnson, in contrast, had known personal privation. He had known, as he said, what hate can do to the eyes of a child in Catella. What was your experience with him in his own discussions about these questions and, and how they came to us? Oh, I mean, I have no doubt. I mean, I only knew him really in the last years of his life in 1967 until he died. But there was no question the time I spent with him in the White House and then on the ranch, he was proudest of civil rights of anything he had ever done. And he knew that it would stand the test of time. And my sense is that once he became president, he had the power. And he had always wanted to do more than he could do. Just as Taylor said, he was stuck. And and it was right to represent the state of Texas. He's a Texas senator. He's a Texas congressman. But once he moved, I don't think it was just John Kennedy's death, although that gave him an opening. I don't think it was just the movement was out there, although that's huge. I mean, I think what you said, Mr. Ambassador, and what you pointed out in this tension between Martin Luther King and LBJ is an inevitable tension between a movement from the outside that's pushing in at the government from the outside in, and there's a president who knows that he needs that movement, but there's going to be tension. No president wants to be pressured from the outside. The same tension existed between Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was constantly telling him, you're not doing everything I want you to do. And eventually, they became really good friends. And and Lincoln understood that he needed Frederick Douglass and the abolitionists just as LBJ needed the civil rights movement. And together, they, Martin Luther King and LBJ produced something, thank God they were there at that moment in history that changed our country forever. Secretary Califano, what would, what would your perspective be on their relationship? You had the good or bad luck to be there when the relationship dissolved, essentially, in, in a way. Well, I, I think at, at both ends of the, of the two. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, it dissolved in the sense that Martin Luther King made a decision about the Vietnam War, and, and, uh, and this was the greatest uh, hair shirt that Johnson had to wear during all those years. Uh, I think uh, he uh, admired King. I think, I think they were both quite uh, good at politics. I mean, I just, you said I wanted to mention Selma, and Andrew did. You know, in January, or January of 65, uh, 64, rather, in a phone conversation, one of these wonderful tape phone conversations between King and the President Johnson. Uh, Johnson starts talking about uh, uh, six, uh, 65, I'm sorry, about the Voting Rights Act, and King reminds him that the five southern states he didn't carry had the lowest voting, voting record. And then Johnson says to King, uh, now, this, if you can find the worst condition this is January 15, 1965. The worst condition you run into in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, South Carolina, uh, where uh, people are denied the right to vote, to cast a vote, if you just take that one illustration, get it on the radio, get it on television, get it in the pulpits, get it in the meetings, every place you can, then pretty soon, the fellow who didn't do anything but drive a tractor would say, well, that's not right. That's not fair. That will help us for what we're going to shove through in the end. (laughs) And and King says, that's right. And if we do that, Johnson said, we'll break through. It will be the greatest breakthrough of anything. This is the Voting Rights Act. Not even accepting the 64 Act. I think the greatest achievement of my administration 
the greatest achievement in foreign policy was the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But I think this will be bigger because we'll do things that even the 64 Act couldn't do. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, a partnership between these two guys that, I mean, was, was wonderful and, you know, idealistic and what have you, but very practical. Uh, King, I think, as you indicated, knew what he was doing. Johnson wanted him to do it. There's always the, you don't like the pressure. And Johnson knew. And the other wonderful exchange here is Johnson says, you know, talk about the right to vote. Don't talk about the right to vote for Negroes. Talk about the right to vote for everybody because it affects every single American. He had another marvelous thing he said on the weekend. Uh, the weekend the bill was signed, he called John Conley and said, don't talk about enforcing it. That makes people's hackles go up. Talk about obeying it because everybody thinks it's right to obey. And Ambassador the meat in the coconut. That was one of his <laughs> exactly. great metaphors. LBJ had these incredible metaphors. It's the meat in the coconut. That's what the voting rights would be. Ambassador Young, uh, I would like you to contrast President Kennedy's relationship with Dr. King and President Johnson's. Harris Wofford has said that Kennedy and King had a kind of prickly relationship that Kennedy thought he was preachy and starchy, and they didn't relate at the level of sort of human discourse so much. It seems to me that the sort of mutual earthiness of Dr. King and President Johnson might have, <laughs> might have served them well in a way. It was, it's, it's just being so. <laughs> Is that earthiness, all yeah, the Southerners? Sure. No, but, but President Kennedy, as you say, really did not understand the South or a race. And President Johnson understood it all too well. And um, Dr. King would say, when I talked to President Kennedy, he asked questions for an hour. But when I go to see President Johnson, he talks for an hour. <laughs> he said he knows what he wants to do, and he knows what want. He said, I'm, I, he, I don't have to convince him of anything, but, uh, well, I think their only tension was, I think Johnson would have liked to have taken the poverty program, uh, aid to education, all of those issues first, and then come back to voting. Uh, and that was one point of tension. We didn't really have that choice. I mean, we didn't like the sit-ins. You know, we didn't like the back of the bus. There would have been much more relevant issues, but we were subject to the, the pressures of the people. And there was so, I mean, so much going on. I mean, well, we saw it on Bloody Sunday. Yes. yes. Uh, that that was a Nazi-like community. You have said that the movement in the streets and the grassroots effort that was so widespread across the country was drafting the 64 bill as surely as the all-white lawyers in the Justice Department and the White House and the Congress were doing that. Uh, but the truth is, the, the people in the end who did the legislative scut work on the bill were all overwhelmingly white men at a time when there were five black members of Congress. D D but, Doris, could you, well, so, go well, on. Well, except that there'd been 30, 40 years of work at Howard University with Yale and Pennsylvania and, and, and the law schools had basically patterned, fashioned uh, the path to freedom. And there was probably more tension between Martin Luther King and Thurgood Marshall <laughs> exactly. than there was between Martin Luther King and, and, and Lyndon Johnson because Thurgood Marshall did not, he felt very uncomfortable with us breaking the law. The concept of civil disobedience was not something he adhered to. But actually, the, only, the first time I read an article about civil disobedience was written by Harris Warford in the Howard University Law Review. And I always thought he was black. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's that famous exchange between uh, Roy Wilkins and Dr. King about Wilkins demanding to know just what have you desegregated, Martin? And Dr. King famously replied, I guess only a few human hearts. And the truth is, Taylor, one of the hearts was apparently John Kennedy's. In that spring of 1963, he was moved to. Well, I would like to say that it was, he was moved by Dr. King's uh, words and example in the movement. But the fact of the matter is that after Birmingham, demonstrations spread to over two, 200 cities Cambridge like wildfire all over. President Kennedy said there were even demonstrations on military bases uh, overseas. And we're either going to put it out one at a time, risking something that makes us look bad in the world, or we're going to have to bite the bullet. Uh, so 
I think that it was uh, the movement, the, the sympathetic demonstrations that spread from Birmingham created the pressure that pushed Kennedy to give that speech. On the other hand, that speech ought to be much more iconic than it is. Uh, uh, right now it ranks way behind, ask not what you can do for your country and ich bin ein Berliner. But to say we are confronted primarily with a moral issue, it is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the US Constitution, was just what Dr. King had been asking him to say. And that was a shining moment in the night Medgar Evers was killed and in introducing this bill. But that was the peak, that was a, an isolated uh, moment. And I think it was a combination of, you know, it was not written, it, he decided to do it that afternoon and was still writing it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it was, it was impromptu. Uh, and in some senses, it came from the heart. And that's one of the best things you can, you can say about that, that, that his highest speech came from the heart uh, under the pressures of the moment. But the pressures were severe. And uh, he was cutting loose from the Democratic Southern base that had anchored Democrats in the White House for a century. And, and he knew that. But he did it with very fine words. I, I think. You know, I was general counsel of the Army at the time of the 63 march. And uh, initially, uh, Robert Kennedy, who had, John Douglas was his representative, and, and Cy Vance, who was the Secretary of the Army, we, we met, I, uh, John Douglas and I met with uh, Bayard Rustin and Walter Fauntroy, planning them. Uh, Bobby Kennedy did not want the march to take place. Vance did not want the march to take place. Uh, it, the, the Kennedys just saw this as a political issue. It was not, there was no, I mean, Bobby Kennedy was really tough on this. But we came back from that meeting and said, this march is going to happen. And at that point, uh, there was terrible concern about the march. I mean, we, just to give you a sense, I mean, we had military people in Mufti and the, um, and the crowd. Uh, we closed all the liquor stores in Washington. We literally uh, called hotels to tell them to. We, but neither Kennedy nor Vance wanted anybody to stay overnight. Come in and go out the same day. Come and go in and out. We couldn't. We can't take the chance. We asked the hotels to impose outrageous prices for their rooms. I got an argument with the cardinal uh, in Washington because the Catholic Church was providing cots. We didn't want any cots in the, in the gyms. I mean, it really gave you a sense of that. We, I watched the march with Vance in the Army War Room, filmed. We had people up, up, on top of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, it was all really scared about violence, 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 and sort of something nobody really wanted. If, if only these guys. If only King wouldn't do this. If only these guys wouldn't. We even had a, John Lewis, who will be here this afternoon, had a stinging speech attacking Kennedy. And we did everything we could to put the heat on Lewis to tone it down. <laughs> well, because the archbishop was going to get up yeah. to go. And, and uh, I think that march had a profound impact on everybody in the government. I mean, I began to see things change dramatically. But I will say. I uh, was still sitting in the Pentagon then. Within a month after Johnson became president, uh, the government changed. I mean, I mean, the pressure to do civil rights. I mean, you know better than I do, uh, Taylor, but it was in his gut. It was really in his gut. Doris, if I could ask you about that, because here in this wonderful institution, with no disrespect to President Johnson's colossal role in this bill, it's fair to say that many other people in Congress had a hand in it, too. And we forget, and probably President Johnson will be eager to remind us what a crucial role the Republicans played, for example. But I think it's less well known that in the Senate, particularly, the president was chafing. You can read in those transcripts and hear in the tapes, he was chomping at the bit at Mike Mansfield and Hubert Humphrey, wanting them to hold the Senate round the clock, wanting them to go into overdrive. And they thought the best strategy was to let the Southerners talk and exhaust themselves. What discipline must it have taken him to restrain himself, to control himself, and to not apply the Johnson treatment willy-nilly as part of getting the bill done? No, I mean, that shows an extraordinary understanding of the Congress, which was his home. He knew when to apply that pressure and when to let up. And he knew for a certain period of time that he had to trust his leaders there, particularly Hubert Humphrey, 
who I think did an extraordinary job during all of this. But he would call when he needed to. I mean, the, the discussions with Dirksen are just fabulous, right? I mean, Dirksen, you come with me on this bill, and 200 years from now, school children will know only two names, Abraham no, Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How can Dirksen resist, right? You know, and then the NAACP will be flying your banner. But you know, just to go back to what we were just saying before, I think that tension between a social movement pushing at a president is the best moment in our American history. I mean, the progressive movement pushed at Teddy Roosevelt, the abolitionists pushed at Abraham Lincoln, and the civil rights movement pushed at Kennedy and Johnson. And that's where change takes place, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the abolitionist movement, the civil rights movement. And you need, however, a president who's open to that. And I think that even though JFK had started to be open to it after that march, um, what you needed was somebody who was going to put it at the top of his agenda and that's what LBJ did. He was able to understand that he could say in his first speech to Congress, no memorial would matter to JFK more than the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. So he used that whole feeling toward LBJ, I mean toward JFK and his death to help him. But then it became his thing. And when you have a leader, the stature of Martin Luther King, when you have an Andrew Young, we were lucky to have those moments, as I said before, in history. Those generations don't only exist. God almighty, we need one now, a generation of those kind of leaders. I think these two men knew each other even the week before the president declined to run again. I heard them on the phone talking like brothers, like pastor and member. Wow. Uh, and, um, and yet, in the midst of this, you had two alien forces, I think, mm. dividing them. One was J. Edgar Hoover, uh, and the other was what I call the Harvard Mafia. That, uh, uh, I thought you, know. you were going to say Vietnam. <laughs> well, that's the Harvard Mafia. Yeah. <laughs> the best and the brightest. <laughs> that's where it came from. Well, that's where, you know, it, it was, it was in, in fact, I, I think that I didn't realize until Nick Cott's book that, uh, that right about Bloody Sunday was the overthrow of one of the governments in Vietnam. And Johnson was not focused on Vietnam at all. He was trying to deal with Selma. And McNamara said, why don't we send in two battalions? And Johnson said, we cannot win this war. And McNamara's answer was, nobody will know. Everybody's concerned about, it. we'll at least f f fly the flag. But he was, he was lured into Vietnam. And one of the reasons why Dr. King stood up against the war in Vietnam was, he thought he was standing with President Johnson. Because President Johnson would say to him over the phone, look, they're trying to get me to bomb this. They're trying to get me to do that. You don't know the job I have standing up against the generals. They want more troops. They want them. And, and so he, he felt that plus the meeting with Thich Nhat Hanh, mm -hmm. who explained to him the Buddhist position uh, of the tension between the, the, the Vietnamese and the Chinese. And ironically, the one war I had to mediate at the UN was between China and Vietnam. Uh, and so they were wrong about Vietnam. And we knew it, and nobody would admit it. And that, that I think, plus, uh, and I, I still don't understand uh, what Hoover's motivation was. Uh, but he had a, a, a sick envy a hatred of Martin Luther King. Yeah, let me, on, just to come, on two points. On Hoover, yes, I remember I was then Bob McNamara's assistant in the Pentagon, Selma, and Hoover sent this memo out describing Dr. King uh, and I said, to, to all the cabinet officers, unbelievable. But you're right about the Selma thing. After Bloody Sunday, uh, when the march resumed, Johnson sent troops uh, we, we nationalized the guard so that we control to protect the marches. I was my instruction was to send memos to the White House every two hours. Wow! About those marches, and they're actually uh, you can read them. You can read them. You can read them. They're actually on the LBJ Library tapes. Every two hours, where they were, how far they'd gotten. 
because, uh, and I sent them to Jack Valenny, uh, who would, would bring them into the present, questions would come back. He just didn't, he was so focused on Selma, it, it, and on that, on that march working, uh, it, was, it was really quite remarkable. Well, I think one of the things that people forget if, if they are not familiar with the period is how many things were cheek by jowl, as Taylor pointed out. The assassination of Medgar Evers happened just hours after President Kennedy's speech. Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner went missing just as the bill was coming to final passage. Senator Kennedy was in the terrible plane crash on the night the Senate passed the bill. Your head spins at all the things the president is dealing with. Um, but it was remarkable how unwilling President Johnson was for such a famous wheeler dealer to wheel and deal. Everett Dirksen came to the White House thinking he was gonna get a grand bargain, a compromise, and he didn't. He was sent away in 20 minutes empty-handed. There's a marvelous exchange on the tapes where Johnson tells Humphrey, I'm against these amendments. I'm gonna be against them right up till I sign them. And he, he, never, he, he never did have to sign them. But you know, the, other, the sort of poignant part, Taylor, is that the, the signing of the bill and the passage of the 64 Act, together with 65, but it really represents a kind of high watermark of consensus, and just weeks later, with the nomination of Barry Goldwater in San Francisco, the Republicans been, begin their long transformation of identity. And in Atlantic City, the conflict between the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and the regular Democratic Party give <clears throat> President Johnson incredible heartburn and heartache. And talk a little bit about how, just even in the wake of the signing of the bill, the, the good feeling and consensus that had made it possible began to dissipate. Well, I think we have to look at this period uh, with a sense of history that, that is rare. Uh, 50 years ago, there wasn't a Republican in Congress from Texas to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it was the solid South, and 80% and of Republicans in both houses of Congress voted for the Civil Rights Act in 1964. But at the same time, with Goldwater announcing his opposition to the bill and Johnson uh, pushing the bill forward, you had something unprecedented in history, which is that the, the parties reversed abruptly their 100-year-old position on race, which has always been the litmus test of democracy in America. Uh, and it switched, nothing but race. Try to imagine something today that could happen in politics that next year would have Republicans voting Democrat and Democrats voting Republican. I grew up in Atlanta, we didn't even know any Republicans. They were, they were, they they were, were from Philadelphia. They were polar bears, they not, were Yankees. Not true, not true. Not true. Well, there were, there no, were some no, black the, and tan. The, 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 actually, when I went to Georgia in 1954, they asked me to run a voter registration drive to support Eisenhower. Wow. Yes. And uh, I said, but I'm a Stevenson supporter. They said, not here. <laughs> they said, in Georgia, if Stevenson wins, Richard Russell appoints the federal judges. Mm. Right. If Eisenhower wins, we get to nominate the judges. And the whole, the whole bevy of Southern judges that really saved the nation were all Republican appointees. But what, I, what I'm saying wow. is there's this amazing, con as a historian, and I'm so glad the LBJ Library has all those amazing tapes of Johnson, because I guarantee you if those tapes didn't exist, there would be, people would be pushing a consensus that Johnson never had his heart in any of those things. Because if there's one thing that overshadows the tendency of race to determine how we perform, it's our tendency to misremember race. I was brought up taught that the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery. People <laughs> want to misremember it. And those tapes preserve the intimacy of yeah. Johnson's feelings in ways that I think will resist that. And we really need a balance again about how, I think race, Johnson shows that race is the, was the gateway, the Civil Rights Bill, to broader freedoms for lots of other people. It opened the door for the women's movement, for all kinds of disability movement, things that are hard to imagine that, that, that back then women couldn't serve on juries and, and uh, women couldn't dream of going to the Ivy League schools, let alone West Point. And all those doors opened in the, in the wake of going through the, the gate of race, but at the same time, people started wanting to misremember it and say that this was a bad time. Uh, President Clinton told me once in one of our interview sessions that he could predict how people were going to vote with 85 percent accuracy by asking one question, do you think the 60s on balance were good or bad for America? And wow. that's the reinterpretation yeah. of all this when in fact I think Andy and, 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 and Johnson, but the, the, the civil rights leaders were 
in the role of modern father, fa founding fathers. They were, they were confronting subjugation and they were setting in motion equal citizenship. Uh, but we don't remember it that way always. That's why I think this 50th anniversary is such a great opportunity to get the memory more in balance of what really happened. And, and I think there's no question. Oh, there you go. And there's no question that I think for historians 200 years from now, those tapes will still be the gold star. Oh, unbelievable. Because you understand where the president's coming from. You understand where the people he's talking to are coming from. I mean, I'll never forget, years later, I met this man named Don Kendall, who was the CEO of Pepsi-Cola. And he told me that, he, no, I knew you knew Johnson when you were a young girl, but I bet you don't know the following story. I'm about to tell you. He told me that when Nixon was first made president, he, Kendall, was asked to go to the ranch to talk to Johnson about some private matter for Nixon. And Johnson's working on his memoirs. He's grumpy, saying, how am I supposed to remember anything? He said, the only chapters that are any good at all. I had these little tape machines, and I pressed it on my Oval Office, and I have verbatim conversations. Those chapters are coming out great. So you go back and tell your good friend Nixon as he starts his presidency, <laughs> there's nothing more important than a taping system. <laughs> And thereby, he contributes to the downfall of his good friend, but Richard Nixon. Th th that, that lapse in historical judgment notwithstanding, President Johnson was prescient on the night of July 2nd, telling Bill Moyers he feared that just the change you talked about was coming. But Doris, you've also written about how he said that he felt he had to get civil rights to establish his credibility, his bona fides, so that he could then do the things, the great society that were so important to him, to push the freedom uh, envelope further, to push opportunity even further. And I wonder, Joe, if you could talk a little bit about how did Dr. King give him credit for that, and you too, Mr. Ambassador, for, for doing that? And they were obviously on the same page. They were divided later by Vietnam and, as you say, by Hoover. But did Dr. King give him credit for, for that? I, I, I think Andy can answer that better but than no, I can. I, he I certainly I did. Think, I, don't, I don't think he was yeah. – uh, relevant is the wrong word, but he certainly wasn't involved when you look at, uh, you know, everything from Head Start to, you know, elementary and secondary education, higher education, the food stamp program, uh, all Medicare, Medicaid, and what have you. And I think it's important to know uh, race, was, race was an issue in those great society programs because uh, you'll, you may, some of you may remember Adam Clayton Powell. We, we couldn't get the Elementary and Secondary Education Act through. Uh, there were two problems. One was the Catholics wanted help for parochial schools and the evangelicals and the secular urban Jews didn't want any help for parochial schools, and both had the power to block it. But, but a, Johnson saw as a killer problem, uh, people, the, the Congress would begin to look at this as a black bill, mm -hmm. the poor schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. That, incidentally, for those of you who go back that far, is why he told Adam Clayton Powell, you have to get out of town. Powell went to Bimini, never recovered from that little joint. <laughs> But, uh, and then moved to Ukerry. Irish governor, uh, Irish congressman from, from, from uh, New York passed. He, Johnson did not want black involvement in that legislation in any public way. Kerry came up with the idea of leasing, bill, leasing uh, books and things. The bill passes the House. Johnson says, call Speaker McCormick. Tell him not to send the bill here for another month because that, I want to sign it on you, Carrie's birthday. Wow. He wow. figured this out. And he had the <laughs> bill come over. So I don't, I, I don't think it was that, I guess Todd, I, guess would, I don't think it was that King wasn't interested. You can answer that part of it. But I, I surely know that we were constantly worried that people would see these, these great society programs That's aimed at narrowly. the poor. As, as a, on a race basis. And we didn't want that either. And, and I think the, the last gathering we had, uh, Dr. King brought together 23 different minority groups, uh, four or five different Hispanic groups, uh, poor whites from Appalachia and from the cities, and the welfare rights movement. And, and the whole idea of the Poor People's Campaign was we didn't think, we, we knew segregation was about race, and we knew, but we didn't even think voting rights was just a racial issue. Uh, and and, and I, I, to this day, uh, think that President Johnson knew poverty and knew the poor. And he had taught kids 
who came to school hungry. And those were the people he was most concerned. He was probably, and I think Dr. King thought he was more concerned about the poor than the vote. And I think that he was probably wrong. He was right in saying that we'd lose the South. But we've had four Southern presidents since the Voting Rights Act. You know, Clinton, Carter, uh, Bush, and of course Johnson himself. But uh, it, it, we haven't lost the South. And the South's gonna rise again <laughs> <laughs> on November on November fourth. We're gonna see another new South. Oh, but hooray, you know, hooray. We we tend to forget how intertwined the question of economic fairness and economic justice always was with the civil rights movement. The march on Washington was the march for jobs and freedom. When President Kennedy proposed the bill, he cited this sobering set of statistics that Harris Wofford had first worked up for him in 1960 about the differential prospects of a black and white baby born on the same place the same day. And on questions like access to opportunity, life expectancy, blacks are doing much better today than they did in 1963. But on questions of lifetime earning power, economic power, it's distressingly almost identical. And what do you think both Dr. King and President Johnson would have made of this enduring Gap, and what do you think we as a country today can do about it? I we didn't finish on, on Medicaid. I just want to point out on the life expectancy, the real promoter of that was Medicaid, not Medicare, not high tech medicine, giving the poor people a health care healthier dramatically. I mean, the, the, the black life expectancy went from just over 40 to 60 plus over, over you know, in a few years. So they are, they are entwined, I'm sorry, I just... No, I, I think that, that now I'm, I'm holding this uh, Social Security card uh, with my oh, picture on it. <laughs> uh, because there, there are things that we, would, we need to do. We need to make the vote more accessible. And, and a Social Security card with your picture on it uh, is something that that you need to get in a hotel, you need to get on an airplane, you need a government issued ID and the, the Social Security Administration could do it for nine cents a piece. Uh, and it, and it, it would do a lot to save money if the government began to send its m money through banking channels. It would put a lot more money in the bank. I mean, if, if we really wanted to make government efficient, uh, and I think those are the kinds of things that, that, that Dr. King and President Johnson were interested in. They weren't interested in just the show. They were interested in the delivery and how do you wipe out poverty. Uh, you, you can't just, Dr. King at one point said a guaranteed annual income. Uh, just give people money and give them a chance. Uh, that wouldn't fly too well in, in today's work. But we still have to have a way to make democracy and free enterprise work for poor people of all colors. Absolutely. Taylor and Doris, I'd like to ask you both. Uh, tomorrow morning, a young fellow who was, uh, received the nomination for president on August 27, 2008 in Denver on what would have been President Johnson's 100th birthday, and an occasion where, as I remember it, President Johnson's name was not mentioned. Um, White House aides tend to tell me that President Obama's general reaction to comparisons between his situation and President Johnson's is yada, yada, yada. So since you are professional historians and I'm just a journalist writing about history who can easily be ignored, I wonder first, Taylor, and then you, Doris, what you think President Obama could profitably take away from President Johnson and his relationship with Dr. King and the world that they faced? And are there, is there anything that could be comparable, any instruction we could take to, in the present day uh, from President Johnson about how to get something done? Well, I, I, I think he could say, first of all, he needs to get 67 senators. Um, he only on, needs 60 now, and you know, so. Yeah, which he doesn't have, yeah. and in that sense, and to change the, the mood of the country from cynicism to optimism is not something that is totally within the purview of the president. So in that sense, I think President Obama is fair to say it's a totally different in environment and atmosphere. On the other hand, I wish he talked more about race and how it contributed 
when we deal honestly with it, not to become the, the issue that dwarfs all others, but is a way that helps inform all the others. Uh, we go nuts whenever he even mentions anything. Uh, I, there was a quote in the New York Times saying that his comment about Trayvon Martin betrayed the great promise of America, which is never to discuss race. Never to discuss race turns American history and politics into a fairy tale. And uh, I do think Obama's a little too captive uh, in that, but I, he is facing a gridlock where, where the, uh, the, that is not comparable to, to what President Johnson had. And, that was because of two things, World War II and the great optimism that came out of that. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to lick polio. We're, uh, we, we were optimistic. And the civil rights movement had been building up an optimistic, patriotic sense of sacrifice from the Brown decision for years into the 60s that, that made people say, well, maybe something good happened can happen when we confront these intractable problems. So Obama has neither of those uh, major advantages. And so I think that it's... It, it's unfair to look to the president to do all of it. The great moment for Dr. King to me with President Johnson was after Selma, they had a phone conversation where Johnson says to Dr. King, I couldn't have done anything until you got down there and mobilized the people and there were nuns flying in from everywhere into Selma and the whole mood of the country changed. Your movement aroused them so that I could go before Congress in that night session. Uh, he said that was about the greatest thing that ever happened. And King is saying absolutely right. An aroused, responsible citizenry with an optimistic, patriotic agenda, get, getting responsive government, that's what America is about. So it's not all up just to President uh, Obama. It's up to us, too. I, th I think there's two major changes in our political culture today that make it much harder for President Obama than it was for President Johnson. One is that in the old days, they used to stay in Washington together on the weekends. They formed friendships over party lines. They weren't rushing home to raise money for these escalating campaign costs, which I still are convinced are the poison in the system today. How much time these stupid people, I shouldn't say stupid people, how much time our congressmen and senators spend raising money and going back to do it rather than doing the business of the country. And television exacerbates it, they want people on Either side's districting exacerbates it. They look at each other with tribal alliances now rather than friendships, and that makes it harder. I also think the bully pulpit makes it harder today that if a president gives a speech, it used to be covered on all three networks. Everybody watched it. Now you have the pundits like us sometimes tearing it apart before it's even begun, and you've got people watching their own cable networks only seeing a part of the speech. So all of those things are true, but I think the one thing that President Obama can do now which goes to the heart of LBJ and what you were talking about with the mixture between poverty and race, when he talks about the defining issue of our time being the gap between the rich and the poor and the lack of mobility. President Johnson in his Howard University speech talked about you can't just bring people to the starting race and gate and think they're going to have an equal chance for the race. That opportunity has to be deeply built into the society. When we see now that in our country, the people born in the bottom fifth have a less chance of getting up beyond that than people in Europe. This was the promise of America, that if you worked hard, you would be able to mobilize through the society. And I think Obama's recognized that. He's talked about that. And it should be the defining issue. And in the end, Dr. King was talking about poverty. That was the whole movement that was economic opportunity was the next step after civil rights. And boy, do we need that now. You know, it, it's, it's, it's very hard, though. As mayor, I could never talk about race in Atlanta. But looking back, everything I did to help people help black and white together. Right. Now, you don't see that at the time, but uh, I don't think I ever cast a vote in all of my political career that just helped black people. That every vote I cast helped 10 times as many blacks as whites. And we've got to deracialize these issues uh, to get people to look at them a, a bit more objectively. Because the, the stabbing in the schools today, just before we got here, 19 kids stabbed. That, that's not race. That, that, that's a culture of violence. It, 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 it's a sickness that's pervading our society that's far more complicated than anything Dr. King and, and President Johnson had to deal with. Uh, Bernice King is dealing with it in the school name for her mother. Uh, 
where she went into a, a rough neighborhood and, and declared, got the girls there in this middle school to say, we're going to try 100 days of nonviolence. And she made it work. And, but this was a rough school that the teachers could not handle. But going in talking about nonviolence in a public school that was all black uh, is, is something we've, we've, we've got to deal with the culture of violence. The things that President Carter talked about, the, 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 the fact that, that there are more spousal abuses, murders, than there are in the wars nowadays. More domestic violence than, than military killings. I mean, that, that's, that's a sickness in society that we've got to somehow find a way to face. It's not, it, it's not what it used to be. Ms. Secretary, your last up. My, my last, I'm last up. I, I want to just say one thing about violence. I can't, cannot resist the fact that, uh, remember, alcohol and drugs, but particularly alcohol, is involved in about three-fourths of the rapes in this country and of the incidents of domestic violence. So we've got a hell of a lot to do about that problem to deal with. It has nothing to do with race. Uh, I think uh, there are some lessons for President Obama. I guess I disagree a little bit here. Uh, I think one is uh, it, it's, it's important to recognize, which Johnson did, that when you sign the law, that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's not the end. Uh, when he signed the Voting Rights Act, he announced that uh, the Justice Department was filing suit the next morning to have the Mississippi poll tax declared unconstitutional. We sent scores of monitors into the other southern states. Uh, secondly, I think there are opportunities of various kinds, and, I, and I'd say, I think, and maybe this is something to mention, especially with Dr. King, Johnson was very opportunistic in the best way. He was opportunistic in using the Kennedy assassination as part of his ability to get the 64 Act passed. When Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, that night, that night, he said to me, we're going to get one good thing out of this horrible fair act. Housing. We're going to get the fair housing bill. We've been trying for four years to get it. He, he wanted a draft letter the next morning, which he sent to the Speaker of the House. He sent a handwritten note to Jerry Ford, the minority leader of the House, to, to, get, to get that bill passed. When Robert Kennedy was killed, he said, we're going to get our gun control bill. We didn't, we didn't get all of it. We got about half of it, but we're going to get it. We're going to get something good out of this. I think, I think there is, there should be some use of, of this in a much more opportunistic way. I mean, I, I and, a, and a much more immediate way. That's the, that's the last point I would make. You have to go fast. Uh, I, I know, uh, I, I, I thank God we have President Obama in the White House. I wish he had moved on gun control with that lame duck session. He would have gotten a gun control bill. He waited a couple of months to look at it. You can't. And if we had instant problems then, I mean, we're in a world, I mean, you live in it more than any of us, I guess, with, with, uh, with your reporting. You know, we have 30-second attention spans. Uh, and lastly, and I just, uh, I think uh, Obama, one of the problems he has is because he is black. I think there's a, there are a lot of people, and let's be realistic about this. Uh, I think uh, there still is a lot of resentment about that among people in Congress, among people all over this country. And we got to get over that. We well, really got to get over that. And that In that context, it, it does seem worth remembering in this room that President Johnson's last public appearance was on this stage, in this room, at a conference on civil rights, marking the opening of some of the civil rights papers here in this library. And on that day, he said nothing was more close to his heart, nothing was more essentially him. And he also famously said that whites stand on history's mountain and blacks in history's hollow. And the challenge for America was to stand blacks and whites on level ground. And I'm honored to be part of this discussion today, but I think your, your discussion has shown that the work President Johnson so nobly began 50 years ago is not over, and, and thank you all for all you do to keep the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you.